Welcome to Central United Methodist Church on this blessed Sunday morning. May God richly bless you. Every year, millions of Christians around the world begin the Easter season by celebrating Lent. Lent is a period of 40 days, not including Sundays, that runs from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday, the day before Easter. The 40 days of Lent are to commemorate the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the wilderness before beginning his earthly ministry, and is meant to help Christians spiritually prepare for Easter. Christians start the Lenten season by celebrating Ash Wednesday, where during evening services they receive the mark of the cross on their forehead. The cross is created from ashes made from the burned palms used from the previous year for Palm Sunday and combined with olive oil. The ashes are to remind us of the passage in Genesis 3.19, which states that, For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. It also reminds us that we are nothing without the Lord, and that we are to look to the cross of Jesus to live. During this 40-day period, Christians will often abstain from things such as meat, sugar, alcohol, or tobacco. They will also seek to do things that will help bring them closer to Christ, such as serving others, giving alms, seeking to pray more fervently, or reading more from the scriptures. One of um, what's Passion Tide? Traditionally, Passion Tide refers to the last two weeks of Lent, beginning on the fifth Sunday of Lent, long celebrated as Passion Sunday and ending on Holy Saturday. The word Tide refers to a season or time. The final two weeks of Lent is a period of time to focus even more on the passion and death of Jesus. The joy of Easter is almost here, but before that we must accompany Jesus on his way to Calvary. In chapter 1 we saw that Christ was Paul's all in all. The second chapter talks about humility and how it is based on the principle one for all and all for one. And in chapter 3 and 4 we look the problem in the face, division. How can we heal divisions? How can we walk together when we're so different from each other? Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus.
lesson this morning is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regret as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, the one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached a goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My, our message title this morning is Winning the Grand Prize. Bow with me. Gracious and loving Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts and the graces that you give to each and every one of us. We ask, Lord, as we hear these words from Philippians, that we are able to take these words and store them in our hearts and in our minds that we can share as we are called to spread the good news of Jesus to all we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may have already won $10 million said the flyer. It was from a company called American Family Publishers. Surely you remember them. Their main spokesman was a famous television personality named Ed McMahon. Jimmy, Johnny Carson's sidekick, for those of us old enough to remember Johnny Carson. Notice the clever wording, you may have won, implying that it was a done deal and you were the winner. American Family Publishers folded a few years ago. A similar company, Publishers Clearinghouse, is still in business, also selling magazines by promising major prizes to their winners. I'm not going to ask how many of you have ever returned one of those entry forms. Some of you are still probably receiving magazines that you first purchased from American Family Publishers or Publishers Clearinghouse years ago. Somehow in 1997, a church, the Bushnell Assembly of God in Bushnell, Florida, got on the mailing list of the American Family Publishers. A computer somehow twisted the name of the church and a sweet stakes notice was addressed to God of Bushnell and was sent to the church's address. The accompanying letter read something like this. 
Dear God, we're searching for you. You have been positively, positively identified as one of our $11 million mystery millionaires. I'll be bet God was pretty excited about that, don't you think? The letter went on to say, what an incredible fortune there would be for God. Imagine the looks you'd get from neighbors and friends. But don't just sit there, God. Come forward now and claim your prize. We're not told if God returned the order plan or not. Certainly for most of us, lonely humans, $11 million would be a substantial prize. However, for God, I doubt that it would buy one tiny piece of pavement on those streets of gold. Our lesson for the day from Philippians tells us that St. Paul wanted to win a prize, but it wasn't mere money that he was seeking. Actually, he wanted more than $11 million. He wanted a prize of infinite value. He writes, I wanted to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering. Become, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. St. Paul had one goal in mind and he was straining for all his might to obtain that goal. And that was to know Jesus Christ, to know him in his death on the cross, and to know him in the power of his resurrection. No wonder St. Paul had such a lasting impact on the world. It takes a real difference in your life when you know what your goal in life is and when you give yourself unreservedly to that goal. A few years ago, a pair of South American men decided on the spur of the moment and without first informing their families to go out in a small boat to do some fishing in the ocean. Unfortunately, their motor failed and the current swept them out into the vastness of the Atlantic. Within hours, they no longer could see the coastline. Weeks of hunger and thirst, sunburn and fear passed by as they struggled to survive on the few fish they were able to catch and the meager amount of rainwater they could capture. Both men were strong and fit, but six weeks after the start of their ordeal, one man succumbed to despair and death. The other, however, clung to the hope of seeing his mother again. He passionately wanted to spare her the grief his disappearance and presumed death would bring. And this hope sustained him until many weeks later, at last, a freighter happened upon him and rescued him. Think of that. The surviving castaway dared to hope he'd see his mother again. And that may very well have been the factor in his survival. It makes a real difference in your life when you know what your goal is and when you give yourself unreservedly to that goal, not that you will always achieve your goals. Tony Coppola tells a humorous story about a friend of his who attended a prayer meeting where people shared 
with each other about how God could answer their prayers. One elderly missionary told how she had gone to the mission fields wanting very much to be married. The other missionaries who worked alongside her were all married and had good companionships. She longed for the same companionship these couples enjoyed. She had prayed long and hard for a husband, but it had not happened. Out of curiosity, one of the women in the group inquired, but why is it that in spite of your many prayers that you never got married? The elderly missionary woman smiled as she answered, somewhere there's a 70 year old man who has been fighting the will of God for over 50 years. <laughs> we don't always fulfill our dreams, but having a compelling goal is a vital ingredient in effective and a successful life. Unfortunately, many Christians do not have a clear understanding of what God expects from them. In one of his books, Bible scholar William Barclay told of a doll that he once owned. His name was Rusty, a bull terrier who would accompany Barclay on walks down to the meadows and beside the stream. When they reached the stream, Rusty had a passion for plunging into the water, locating a rock on the bottom of the stream getting it in his mouth and bringing it to the bank. He would carefully deposit the stones some distance from the water's edge and then go for another one. Time and time again, he would fetch his treasured rock, repeating the process for hours, if so allowed. Or Clay asked this question, what is the point of retrieving rocks from the bottom of the stream? for this dog. So far as he could determine, there were none. The exercise served no tangible purpose at all. Or Clay then observed that this is the way many Christians are. They seem to be going through the same monotonous routine each and every day, but without a purpose with no projected goals. They appeared not to know what their reason for existing actually is. Now, let me hasten to say that you're not going to hell if you don't have a distinct purpose for your life. Some people blunder through life quite nicely with no purpose, but you won't find life as fulfilling as you would if you knew where you, <clears throat> you were fulfilling God's plan for your life. It was the Swiss, the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung who wrote, most of the people I see suffer not from physical Ill illness, but from spiritual aimlessness. They have lost their aim. They have lost sight of who they really are and what is really valuable. The happiest people in this world are people who know God's will for their life and seek with all their heart to live according to God's will. An Australian website recently carried a story of a young man named Peter who happened on a, pur a purpose for his life in a very unusual way. Peter's life had a most unpromising beginning. At age nine, he was put into an institution for running away from foster homes. By the time he was an adult, he had been in and out of jail for many years and had received and had reached a point where he was selling $40,000 worth of drugs a day. After a heavy-handed police raid, Peter started to, re <clears throat> to reevaluate his life's direction. It was then that God revealed himself to Peter in a very tangible way. 
One day, Peter heard God say to him quite distinctly, Peter, I want you to follow me. Over and over again, he heard the command, feeling troubled and not knowing the source of the voice. Peter jumped on his motorcycle to try to escape it until his brand new motorcycle broke down. Covered in tattoos and dripping with jewelry, Peter decided to hitch a ride back in town. A young couple picked him up and after a few minutes, the driver turned around and said, I feel like I've got to tell you something. God's telling me to tell you that he loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. With that, Peter became emotional and asked to be dropped off to collect himself. The next car picked him up and the driver basically had the same message. God loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And so did the third driver in the next car. It's hard to believe, but three times in one day, Peter received practically the same message from three totally different people. The next day was Sunday, so Peter decided he was going to go to church. And when the pastor gave an invitation to Christian discipleship, Peter went forward and gave his life to Christ. Now, Peter's the founder and CEO of Shalom House in Western Australia, a live-in rehabilitation facility that is bringing restoration to the lives of men and their families in that Australian community. It's said that God moves in mysterious ways. God certainly moves in a mysterious way in Peter's life. Today, he has a firm direction for his life, and he is making his life count for something significant. Peter's experience is much like St. Paul's Damascus Road experience. Remember, St. Paul was on a journey to persecute Christians. As he neared Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? From that day forward, St. Paul was determined to do and to be what he believed Christ had called him to do and to be. There was no turning back once he had this vision of Christ. Quitting for him was not an option. But one thing I do, he writes, forgetting what is behind and straining for, toward what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. For St. Paul, his journey would, be fin would not be finished until he stepped through heaven's gates. It's just like a scene in an Urban Stone historical novel, The Agony and the Ecstasy. In this inspiring novel, Pope Julius had given Michelangelo a most difficult assignment. The sculptor was to go to the blue hills of Carrer and quarry out a tomb for the Pope. Michelangelo, in turn, selected Gilberto, the finest foreman available in all of Italy to lead the expedition. They hired a fine crew and together set out to fulfill the task. For a long time they labored, but finally the crew gave up. Gilberto spoke for them all when he said to Michelangelo, we've had it, we're tired, it's enough, we can't do it were quitting. Michelangelo looked Gilberto steadily in the eye and said, I can understand if you must quit, but I hope you will understand when I say that I cannot quit. I will find another crew, I will find another foreman, and then I will come back and complete the task 
because I am under the assignment of the Holy Father. And with renewed determination, Michelangelo devoted himself to the task at hand. Michelangelo didn't quit because he was under the assignment of the Holy Father, the Pope. In the same way, St. Paul didn't quit because he was under the assignment of his Heavenly Father. And he believed a prize awaited him, the grandest prize of all, the prize of knowing Christ. Sir Thomas Lipton, founder of Lipton Tea, was an accomplished racer of yachts. He won many boating trophies, except the one he really wanted, the America's Cup. One day, he was showing some friends all his trophies and his home and said, I'd give them all away to get the one I didn't get. I don't believe that St. Paul fell short of his goal. I believe he came to know Christ in both his death and resurrection. In fact, I believe that everyone who seeks to know Christ will one day attain that prize and it will be the prize above all prizes. I want to know Christ, wrote St. Paul. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now is the time where we will receive our tithes and offerings of love. Reminder that church expenses like utilities and salaries continue each week, even when we can't meet together for worship. There are three ways to give. You can mail your checks with your offering envelope. You can drop your offering envelope through the mail slot in the 13th Street ramp door, or you can contribute by clicking on the donate button on our website, www.centralunitedmethodistchurch.org. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Prepare with me for the benediction. May God's created spirit be with us in our hearts and minds as we leave this place. May God's created spirit help us to see with new wonder the splendor of your creation all around us and inspire us to preserve and protect it. Go now in peace, love, and care for one another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.